Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer of any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law, then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that is open for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen. Well, a brief prayer together. Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in, what it meant for you, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Amen. Well, that, of course, is the refrain from an older hymn, and it is an important refrain. It is a necessary quest, and it is foremost in our thinking as we gather month by month to share together in communion. And here in Hebrews chapter 10, we have essentially an exposition as to the nature and significance and value of the work of the Lord Jesus upon the cross. Now, when you think about how many communion services we have shared together and how often we take time to, by our songs and by our study, direct our attention in this way, it may seem almost needless to do so, except for the fact that we realize how quickly we are forgetful, not of the fact 
of the death of Christ, but as to the significance of the death of Christ, and to the fact that we owe everything in terms of our acceptance with God to a work that is outside of us, having been accomplished by Jesus. And I want us just to look at this. We can't obviously expound the 25 verses of the chapter, but I want us to pay attention to it so that tonight we might be better equipped as we come and break bread together and share in this cup. The New Testament makes it very clear, doesn't it, that, the, that Christ's death was not snatched from him. Uh, he says in, uh, in John chapter 10, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. It's for that reason that I've never been keen about uh, books with catchy titles like The Murder of Jesus. It really wasn't a murder. The death of Jesus was not a violent and cruel murder. Jesus was not a helpless victim. The death of Jesus was a positive action taken by Christ. He moved to his death obediently, deliberately, and purposefully. And that becomes perfectly plain in these verses that are before us. And by the time the apostles were hitting the streets of Jerusalem, newly filled with the Holy Spirit, that truth had dawned on them as well. And Peter was able to deal with the great juxtaposition between the malevolence of man and the foreordination of God, as he says to the gathered crowd on the day of Pentecost, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But you remember, he steps forward in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think it's me you're looking for, he says. And of course they were. Now let me try and summarize the 25 verses that we read. First of all, in, in, in verses 1 to 4, if, we, if you want to use another hymn, which is the way I've set my notes up this evening, uh, then the, the way I summarize verses 1 to 4 is in, is in the verse of the hymn, "'Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain.'" That's what he's saying in verses 1 to 4. That's what the hymn writer has captured so magnificently in poetry. If someone said, you know, what, is verse, what are verses 1 to 4 teaching? There you have it, just in the stanza of a good hymn. And that's why I say to you, a good hymn book will keep you fine. What the writer is telling us is that the Old Testament animal sacrifices provided a constant reminder for the user of those sacrifices that they were in need of consistent, continual, cleansing from sin, that the animal sacrifices that were provided within the framework of the Old Testament law portrayed the sacrifice that alone could deal with sin, but although they portrayed that sacrifice in themselves, they could not provide it. And the writer says, you will notice if your Bible is open for you, if they could have done that, then there would have been no need for repetition. If the sacrificial system provided a once-and-for-all atoning answer to the question, then they wouldn't have had to have the Day of Atonement with the high priest going in on an annual basis. But every time that they went through the motions of these things, they were reminded of their sinfulness, of their need for cleansing, and they were reminded that these sacrifices, which God had ordained to take place, were pointing forward to be fulfilled in a final coming sacrifice that would take place in a moment in time that would deal with sin in its entirety and would be once and for all. That's what the writer is pointing out here, because only a human being could actually provide a sacrifice for other human beings. And if we fail to understand that, then we've missed something very, very important. Again, a hymn will help you. The hymn begins, Praise to the holiest in the height, and in the depth be praise. And it, and it has in its second stanza, O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. O wisest love, that flesh and blood 
which did in Adam fail, should strive afresh against the foe, should strive and should prevail. See, a beast could not take the place of a human, ultimately, because the human being in an act of the will, namely in the death of Jesus by an act of his will, lays himself down, offers himself up. A beast, a sheep, a lamb, was sacrificed under coercion. Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sheep. The sacrifice that was required needed to be a man for man. And if it was then to be provided as being permanent in its value, then it would never need to be offered again. And that's the point that he goes on to make. If verses 1 to 4 say that the uh, sacrificial system of the law was ultimately ineffective and purposefully so, then in verses 5 to 9, he tells us that Christ is that heavenly Lamb. And that, again, is in the hymn writer. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. And then the writer says, but Christ, our heavenly Lamb, bears all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. That's what the writer is saying here. Consequently, when Christ came into the world— and then he's quoting from the Old Testament, from the 40th Psalm. And that prophetic psalmist's word indicated that the coming of Jesus would signal the end of Jewish ritual and the provision of the one true and efficacious Savior. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth. And you get this balance of the Bible, don't you, when you realize that here all these words in the psalmists are pointing forward to Jesus, letting us know that we find our way around the Bible by keeping our eyes upon Jesus. And these words become Christ's own. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And when he says you don't take delight in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings, he's not, he's not saying they were irrelevant. He's simply saying they were ineffective. They pointed forward. They fulfilled their purpose. They reminded everybody of their sin. They realized that they were in need of cleansing. But they could only offer something that pointed to the ultimate end, which is provided in the death of the Lord Jesus himself. So the Jewish believers needed to learn that there was no longer any need for them to offer animal sacrifices, no need for them to keep the other ceremonial parts of the law. And why is that? Because of what we read in verse 9. I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. You see what he's saying there? That the promises that are symbolized in the Old Testament offerings have been fulfilled by one single offering of his own body once and for all. Now, I, with this in my mind, we, uh, Sue and I bumped into a, um, a well-known um, actor today, um, a Jewish guy, and uh, I just had occasion to utter pleasantries to him. We talked for a moment or two. I, I had no opportunity to go beyond that. But I haven't been able to get him out of my mind. Uh, if, if you'll forgive me, he just looked a wonderfully Jewish. He looked like Marty Getz, and Marty Getz's his cousins, and he, he looked probably a lot like Jesus might have looked. And as I observed him sitting there, his profile so clear, his long hair now graying, I said, you know, of all the people that I am sad for, I'm sad for secular Jewish people, because they clearly have nothing. At least an Orthodox Jew is still hanging on to the hope that somewhere they will encounter at the end of their searching this Messiah who is to come. But I think 
the average secular Jew has given up on the quest altogether. And I thought about this. This dear man, he needs to know about this Yeshua. He needs to know about this Messiah. He needs to know that all of that stuff has been set aside. The first has been set aside because the second has been put in place. That takes you to verse 10. And by that will, he says, by this sacrifice of a nobler name and a richer blood, the offering of Jesus has achieved the will of God for the salvation of men and women. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been sanctified, past tense, made holy through the offering of Jesus' body once for all. Now, notice the contrast between verse 10 and 11, and between 11 and 12. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Again and again, routinely going through the, the, the motions. They can never take away sins. That's verse 11. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. All his work is ended. Joyfully we sing, Jesus has ascended. Glory to the King. And what has he done? Well, he's made uh, such a triumphant uh, encounter that he's waiting for the ultimate uh, uh, animosity towards him to finally be brought to an end, and, and death will finally be vanquished. In verse 14, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You see this, this amazing uh, distinction between wh wh how we are positionally in Christ and how we are in the ongoing work of Christ. In Christ, we are perfected forever. What does that mean? It means that we are fully and permanently accepted in God's sight on account of the work of God's Son. He has made one sacrifice for sin once and for all. We're not re-sacrificing Jesus. We're not re-representing the sacrifice of Jesus in communion. We're not doing that. There, there would be no reason to do that. The only reason that one would ever do that is if the first sacrifice had somehow or another not accomplished the objective. But the writer tells us, no, it did accomplish the objective. He has made one sacrifice for sin. And as a result of that, we stand complete in Christ. That doesn't mean that we're sinless. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We are both sinful and perfected. Well, what perfection do we have? What perfection did the thief on the cross have? Except the perfection that was his as a result of being enclosed with Christ. And if we don't understand this, if you don't get a hold of this, loved ones, then you, you'll find yourself constantly buffeted by the evil one, constantly tugging at you and plaguing you and annoying you and finding yourself looking for things that you can speak in your defense about how you've really been doing better lately and how you've been reading your Bible a lot more and how you're much better at praying than you used to be last week, and you're, you're really going to seriously make a good stab at witnessing starting tomorrow, or if not tomorrow, then definitely Tuesday. And, and the reason that you feel duty-bound to be advancing all of this is because you don't have confidence that your standing before God is in entirely, ultimately outside of you. It is because of what He has done, because He has accomplished something. And we have trusted in that work. And that alien righteousness, which has been imputed to our account, is there on the basis of the fact that all of our sin has been imputed to Christ. So why would you go back through all of these things? in verses 1 to 4. Well, you never would if you understood it. And the nature of the ongoing work of the Spirit within us, of what we refer to as progressive sanctification, of becoming all that we are in Christ, is necessary. If you don't know that, then just ask your husband or your wife. 
There used to be a girl that sang, a Norwegian girl, I think she was, or maybe Swedish, uh, years ago now in the 70s, uh, Evie. Uh, remember, a little blonde girl. She was around at that time, and she sang, sang a lot of songs. And the, 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 she sang a song, a little country church on the edge of town, doodin, 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 do do, something like that. But uh, the one that stuck for me was when she used to sing a song, clean, clean before my Lord I stand, and in me not one blemish does he see. Well, how could that possibly be? Clean before my Lord I stand, and in me not one blemish does he see? Well, surely then he must see me in some interesting way. Yes, he does. He sees us in his Son. If a man is in Christ, if a woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. So the work of the Spirit within our lives in sanctifying us is a work whereby we are becoming what we are, not that we are becoming what we are not. That's the significance of verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected, past tense, for all time, those who are present continuous tense, being sanctified. And by the way, he says the Holy Spirit testifies to this. And when he says the Holy Spirit testifies to this, he quotes the Bible from Jeremiah chapter 31, the new covenant that has been ratified by the death of Jesus is the pledge that God will remember our sins no more. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, and by the way, I will remember their sins no more. What does that mean? It means at least this, that no further offering for sin is or can ever become necessary. So when we take this cup, when we pass this bread to one another, we're looking back to the finished work of Christ, and we're looking forward on the strength of what has been accomplished. And then in verses 19 through to 25, uh, what you essentially have there are the benefits and the encouragements that are directly related to the work of Jesus. Therefore, he says, Therefore what? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, the confidence to enter the holy places, how? By the blood of Jesus. Not by the blood of bulls and goats. Not as a result of our keeping of the law. Not as a result of our own endeavors. Therefore, brothers and sisters, because you've understood this, therefore you have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. The barrier that had previously shut us out from God has now been shattered. That's why when you read the Gospels, it's so apropos, isn't it, that the body of the Lord Jesus is torn upon the cross. And then the Gospel writer tells us, and at that moment the curtain in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, declaring in a symbolic way that all that had kept us out of the presence of God had now been dealt with as a result of the work of the Son of God. So the benefit of the saving work of Christ is in part to give us confidence to enter. Secondly, to assure our hearts. Verse 22, we should draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I think that's probably an indication of the baptismal rites. What has happened privately and internally in the dealing with our conscience is then displayed obviously and externally in our baptism. And our hearts are assured because the risen Lord Jesus Christ is available now to us to minister to us in our need. And that might be just a word for someone tonight as we come to the end of this day, as we prepare to break bread with one another. As someone who's feeling very much alone, perhaps feeling that you somehow or another have— um, fouled out of things. Now, let me remind you that you have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let me encourage you to hold fast your confession, because you don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with your weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as you are and yet without sin, and therefore with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the benefit is, in our confident entry 
in the assurance of our hearts in verses 24 and 25 in our fellowship with one another. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as some had apparently begun to do, but rather encouraging one another. And then finally he says, and the best is still ahead, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In the same way as it was for the joy that was set before him that Christ endured the cross, so it is for the joy that is set before us. For the day when we will no longer see as in a mirror dimly, but we will see face to face. I spoke with someone this week about the end of life and the prospect of the death of a loved one. And it is so dreadfully sad to think of those partings, because these earthly bonds under God are precious, important, sought after, enjoyed. They're meaningful in every way. We're not, we're not spirits. We don't live in a vacuum. We live dependent upon one another. And inevitably, there will come a day when we're no longer able to enjoy the encouragement and the exhortation of those around us. Encourage one another. Don't neglect meeting together. That's why it's so important to gather with the Lord's people. It's always such a shame when people see that as a kind of regulation or as an obligation or as some kind of legalistic mechanism. It's never portrayed in that way in the Bible. It says, your family, for goodness sake. You've got an elder brother in Jesus. Wouldn't you all want to get together with him and rejoice in what he's done? Because remember, there will be a day when you won't have the opportunity to do it. And it is in prospect of that day that we live our lives in this day. Again, the hymn writer, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, the Son of God who died for me, what rejoicing in his presence when our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain. Communion is actually supposed to be a foretaste of that day. Well, let's minister to one another as we pause for a moment in prayer and as we sing and as we gather around this table. Was it the nails, O Savior, that bound you to the tree. No, it was your everlasting love, your love for even me. O wonder of all wonders, that through your death for me, my open sins, my secret sins, may all forgiven be. O make me understand it. Help me to take it in, what it meant for you, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.